uh, in June is a national SBIR conference. It was in Boston this year. They have it every year. Uh, it's part of a larger event. The larger event is called Tech Connect. The SBIR portion is a two-day portion of a three-day Tech Connect event held in Boston, specifically in the Heinz Convention Center right there, not too far from the waterfront, not too far from Fenway Park, which you see in the lower right of your in image. By less than a mile, I walked over to Fenway Park while I was there. there have these big plaques outside the stadium. World Series champion, 1903. World Series champion, 1912, 1915, 1916, 1918, 2004. <laughs> Something happened in 1918, y'all remember that? They sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. All right, so what was the event itself like? Uh, 250 exhibitors, uh, a couple of SBIR tracks, lots of agency briefings, lots of talks about technology in general since it's Tech Connect. The technology talks were a lot of uh, robots, a lot of printing technologies, electronic printing technologies, a lot of university groups, a lot of businesses. They're primarily looking for partnerships for, in the Tech Connect event. The SBIR portion had several SBIR tracks. There were presentations by all the agencies. And one of the big draws is there's the ability to meet one-on-one -on -one with agency contacts. You could schedule a session in a big room and go sit down on a chair and talk to agency contacts. So I attended all of these sessions for you so that you could remain in Champaign being productive. Fortunately, the sessions were pretty interesting. They weren't too boring. Some of them got kind of boring, but I slept through those for you so you could remain in Champaign being productive. All right, I'll talk first of all about some general trends that kind of span several sections. And then later on, I'll talk specifically about tidbits here and there that I picked up. And then in the middle in between those, I'll talk specifically about the project pitch from NSF because everybody's interested in this new project pitch and how that's gonna work. All right, one of the main trends commercialization is increasingly important. More and more, you have to show that you're a business and you've got a business sense, not just a technology. And this is a long-standing trend. When I was doing SBR proposals 20 years ago, if you had a cool product and it was neat and you got your academic buddies to say, man, this is a cool technology, you could get funded, but that no longer is sufficient. You have to also show that you understand the business of your product. You can get it to market. You've got a sense for the players and what all is involved in placing this product in the marketplace. Uh, uh, consistent with that, TABA is technical and business assistance. I'll talk more about technical and business assistance later on. But you're seeing an increasing amount of technical and business assistance associated with SBIR awards. They're add-ons, they're additional things you can get beyond SBIR work. SBIR, by the way, as you recall from um, the SBIR seminars we've had, funds specifically research and development. It doesn't fund commercialization activities, but there are a lot of add-on programs that do fund the commercialization activities. Related to that, i is proliferating. NSF uh, piloted the i program. You're familiar with i -Corps. It's for commercialization for customer discovery. NSF piloted, and now as expected, a lot of the other agencies are picking up on i programs. NASA has one, NIH has one, the DOD has one. They all have their own little flavors of them. The NSF i program, for example, specifically is before you get a phase one proposal. If you've got a phase one award, you are not eligible for the NSF i program. The NIH works with just the opposite. You're not eligible for i unless you get funded. Then when you're funded, you can apply for an i program. Other add-on programs, not just for commercialization, but there is a, well, the first two here is CAP is a commercialization assistance program. There are the TABA programs. NIH has an application assistance program. If you're a first-time funder, especially if you're a, a woman-owned business or a minority-owned business, they will help you with the application. NSF has a TECP program, which is a technology enhancement program. This is an additional funding to position your product with a particular vendor. Uh, the thinking behind this is if you get funded for an SBIR and then you go out and find a vendor and they want your product, but it doesn't quite meet their specs, you can get additional funding from NSF to meet their specs. 
Uh, a lot of the agencies have matching and investment programs. NASA does. They've got a 2E program. NSF has a 2B program. The Department of Education has a 2B program. The Army has a $500,000 transition partner match program, which is sort of a relative to the TEC program. Uh, these programs that I list here are not exhaustive. There are a lot of add-on programs. So the message for you is that when you're looking with SBIR, especially if you receive an SBIR, look for all these add-on programs. You can get into a lot of other programs besides. NIH also has a 2B program. They're not listed here because their 2B program is a little bit different, but I'll talk about that. It's not an investment match program where the NSF 2B program is an investment match. You have to go out and get investment money. The NIH program doesn't work that way. It's just an additional add-on. If you need more time to get your work done, you can get an additional million dollars. You can get an additional three years to do your work. NIH is huge. There are a lot of different agencies within NIH and, and, and those agencies all operate differently. So you have to see which of the agencies will provide a 2B program or any of the other add-on programs. Uh, TABA funding I mentioned specifically. Uh, this is the technical business assistance. The Small Business Administration is responding to a congressional dictate that allows them to increase the amount of technical and assistance funding that's available to SBIR awardees and SBIR applicants. Currently, the legislation allows agencies to grant up to six and a half thousand dollars for a phase one technical and business assistance. Allows, them, allows an applicant to ask for an additional 50,000 for a phase two technical and business assistance. As with all the SBIR programs, each agency is implementing this differently. Some of them are implementing it fully, some of them are not. Some of them are still going with a, some kind of a partial implementation. Some of the stipulations are that it has to be an outside vendor. You can't just ask for more money to do the work in-house. You have to go out and hire some other outside agent to do that. That's being questioned, by the way. Is that really reasonable? Uh, but because, you know, if you hire someone outside to do all your marketing work, then when it's done, they go away and you don't retain that marketing knowledge as an asset only to the extent that they've communicated it and written it down. So there's some question about whether really it's reasonable to have, have it all be outside. Uh, <clears throat> you can request your own vendor or the agencies can provide a vendor. And even the agencies are wondering some aspects of this and even the Small Business Administration itself is wondering about some aspects of this. Uh, you know, what expenses can you include is a question. Uh, IP expenses, trade show expenses, these are being worked out now and the SBAA is developing a document seeking clarification from Congress so that we can get some guidance about what all is involved. So this is an evolving kind of structure now. What we do know is that uh, the TABA support includes product sales, some amount of intellectual property protection, some market research, market validation, customer discovery, uh, regulatory approvals, some amount of regulatory approvals, and uh, access to literature. So we know that some of, the, some of what can be uh, costed out to these programs, still looking for some others. The program itself is not in question though. The SBIR program is currently authorized through 2022. Uh, it's currently authorized on a like, ongoing basis. Uh, and then in 2022, they'll have to reauthorize it for another period, but there's talk of making it permanent so that it is a permanent part of the United States uh, legislation. There's talking about getting it to fund more of the commercializations within the ISBIR structure. Right now, as I mentioned before, any commercialization activities have to be funded somehow outside the SBIR structure, but maybe they could be included within the SBIR structure. Um, right now, there's an effort to target more underrepresented groups, women, other minorities, and that's not directly part of the program, but that's kind of add-on work. It'd be nice if that were funded, some people think, directly by the program. Uh, right now, the amount of research dollars from the federal government that's allocated towards SBIR is 3.2% of every agency that has over $100 million of research. There's talk about that going up. <laughs> the 3.2%, by the way, is up from 2.2% about 10 years ago. So the, the main takeaway here is there's no talk of this legislation going away. 
All the talk is about expanding it, making bigger, making it permanent. So this is a program that's going to stay. All right, I'll talk a little bit more about some specific priorities of the different agencies that emerged during the talk. EPA is prioritizing waste recovery. That's going to be a growing area. So if you're doing anything involved with waste recovery, you should be thinking about an EPA uh, SBIR program. Department of Homeland Security, which is a small amount, but still they're, they're emphasizing cybersecurity, software and chemical sensors. So if you're developing chemical sensors, you could apply to DHS, you could apply to NSF, you could apply to NIH, you potentially could apply to, e, uh, to um, USDA. A chemical sensor has a lot of potential agencies that you could apply to. DARPA, which is a research and development agency within the uh, Department of Defense, is looking for dramatic increases in technologies that can increase uh, war fighters. Anything that actually supports the soldier out in the field, they're interested in that, but they're looking in dramatic increments, two, two orders of magnitude kind of increase, increases. The Navy, general trends and priorities, Navy wants to move faster, they want to move smarter, but Navy is still behind the Air Force in terms of streamlining the process. The Air Force has this huge AF Works initiative and they're funding more quasi proposals, early stage proposals, not full proposals. They want slide decks, they want white papers, they don't need full proposals. Uh, they're actually awarding one page contracts. Your contract comes one page, that's it. One page contract and you're good to go with an SBIR. Their goal is to provide uh, a contract within three days of receiving the proposal. So if they see something that they like, a simple proposal, they'll award you money and off and running. They're not there yet, but they're making strides in that direction. They're doing that. They want simpler uh, mechanisms, more concrete feedback, more directed. Um, and again, their keys are return on investment, service to the warfighter. The Army has established a set of priorities. They're not involved, in, uh, interested in a 100% solution at some point in the future. They want an 80, they're okay with an 80% solution today. So if you've got something that can do most of a job for the Army, they, you're, you're likely to be funded. They like functional exercises. They like outdoor environments. Soldier enhancement, they like to support that warfighter in the field. Key phrases here, low power, high reliability, low weight everything that the soldier carries, anything that works with the soldiers. And they are very big on enhanced soldier activity, things the soldier carry, carries, technology that surrounds that warfighter. There are six priorities that you see here. And uh, <coughs> I've also listed some of the keywords that you could look at if you're involved in any of the areas that have these keywords in them, you might be uh, interested in submitting to the Army for an SBIR program. All right, let me pause. I've kind of blasted a lot of information uh, at you. I'm going to talk about the project pitch next, but before I do, let me see if there are any questions or any general pieces of information I can give. Any questions from the webinar people? Okay, great. And free, feel free to interrupt me anytime. I'm going pretty quickly to get through a lot of Helter Skelter material. Project pitch, new for NSF. And NSF is still completely figuring out how this is gonna work. But no longer can you just submit a proposal to the National Science Foundation. You have to first submit a project pitch. It's about a three page document. There are four sections. <laughs> they outline the innovation, they outline the company, they outline technical challenges. You submit the project pitch to them sometime within one of their project windows, and then within three weeks you get a response. Either they say, yep, this looks good, you're okay to go ahead and submit a proposal, in which case you can go ahead and submit a proposal. Or they say, we're not sure about this, can you answer some questions for us, in which case you answer the questions, and then they either say, yeah, go ahead, or no, don't submit. Or they tell you, you're not responsive to the program, it's not worth applying, don't apply, please don't apply, in which case, you can submit another project pitch that's related or unrelated. You can only submit one project pitch at a time, so, while you, so you can't just flood them with 10 project pitches and wait for them to respond. 
if they have approved a project pitch, then you can't submit any others unless you've actually submitted an application on that project pitch. So if you have a proposal outstanding, if you submit a proposal, you can't do a project pitch. So they've got some gates to uh, control the flood of project pitches. The process, as I said, is still being worked out. Um, one of the aspects of the process that I didn't mention before is there's no submission deadline. And this is kind of feels odd with NSF, who, who in the past have been so strict and rigorous about the submission deadline that one minute late meant you couldn't submit. Now they're, oh yeah, I submit any time. And then as soon as we get several proposals that are close enough together, <coughs> or me, that we can submit a, uh, or gather a review team, we'll gather and we'll give you an award. So you can submit any time. You'll get funded uh, within six months or so of submission. You'll hear back from them within three to three to four three to four months, regardless of when you submit it. Uh, the funding windows they use to control their funds internally, so that's kind of blind to you. And the funding windows they use to control the, the project pitch submissions. So you can't do more than one within a funding window, but when the next funding window comes around, you could submit one. The program managers have some discretion over the implementation of this. As an aside with NSF, the program managers have a lot of authority, <coughs> a lot more authority than some of the other agencies allow their program managers. So with NSF, it's important to know the program managers. And one thing they said is most of the pitches get approved for funding. Only 10% of them don't get approved. So your chances of getting approved are pretty good as long as you've got a reasonable product pitch. <coughs> Can I get some water, Sherry? As long as you've got a reasonable project pitch, and it's a long line, you probably will be invited for funding. All right, so that's the project pitch. Any questions about the project pitch or how it works? All right, let me go ahead then and uh, just talk about Helter Skelter, some tidbits here and there that I picked up at the conference. One nice thing is that in the EPA presentation, they emphasized the champagne company, uh, EP Purification. So it's kind of nice to have a local company um, represented. You know, I wanted to stand up, I'm from Champagne, I'm from Champagne. But that was nice. Does this logo look like a squid to anybody, by the way? To me, you know, I want a squid logo. Uh, anyway, it looks like a squid to me. But submission process, some elements about the submission process. Everybody complains about SAM.gov. All the agencies complain about SAM.gov. So when you have your complaints about SAM.gov, you are not alone. In fact, NIST specifically recommended that you contact your uh, representative and complain about SAM.gov because that's the avenue for, um, for for making change. It's a U.S. program. Coming soon, not implemented yet, but sometime this year probably or maybe early next year. Your DUNS number will no longer come from Dun and Bradstreet like it does now. You will be able to get the DUNS number from SAM.gov. Is that going to be any better? Probably not if it's SAM.gov, unless they make SAM.gov better. But that's a small change that's coming up. Uh, this was an interesting kind of trend. The number of phase one awardees or the percent of phase one awardees is going up. Uh, I've been reporting 10%, 12%, 15% for the last several years, but some of the agencies said the award rates are rising. They didn't say why, but NSF, the award rate is now up to 20% phase one proposals, NASA 20%, Department of Energy 25%. So award rates are going up, that's good news. Maybe some of these uh, systems like the project pitch are beginning to wean out the weaker proposals. A new agency to SBIR within the Department of Defense is the Defense Health Agency. 
The Defense Health Agency offers a direct to phase two option, which NIH does, by the way. So NIH and DHA are the only two that offer direct to phase two. You can apply for phase two, even if you haven't gotten phase one funding from them. DHA might be of interest to uh, many of the biotech applications that we have here in Champaign because they are interested in biotech as it applies to the armed forces. Some agencies allow you to switch from phase one to phase two, switch agencies from phase one to phase two. USS, US SOCOM, in fact, specifically mentioned that most of their phase two proposals started as phase one awards in other agencies. Whether you can do this is up to the particular agency. So if you want to switch agencies, don't give up on it, but talk to the agency. You have to make sure that the agency will allow it. But that's something that happens from time to time. You can switch at times from phase one to phase two. How about working with some of these agencies? Here are some tidbits that I picked up. NSF, you have flexibility in spending down the phase one grant. You have a phase one award period and if your phase one award period is done and you still have money left over, you can continue to spend it for a while. They're not that concerned about your spending money during that funded period exactly. Their real deadline is the final report. If you have, not, you have 90 days to do your final report and if you spend down the money within that 90 days, they're gonna be okay with that. So they won't actually look to make sure that you've spent the money during the funded period. That's different than the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is very rigorous. You have to spend the money within the funding period. NSF, not so much. Also, informally, if you've submitted a project pitch three times to NSF and they've turned you down all three times, or if you've proposed three times to them and they've turned you down three times, that's probably time to give up. There's no specific hard and fast rule about this. But it seems to be like, you know, if it's not there after three times, it probably isn't going to be there. Three times, it was okay. Two times is perfectly ex expected. That's quite often. You'll submit once, you'll get feedback, you'll submit again, and that's okay. So there's really no black mark in submitting twice, no black mark in submitting three times. After that, though, you probably aren't going to get funded. <clears throat> The NIH commercialization plan, and NIH is a little different than other agencies. NIH has a six page research plan. So the meat of your proposal has to be in six pages. That's not a lot of room. And they established that way before they, the trend towards more commercialization. So they have kind of shoehorned commercialization into their requirements. They say, you have to talk about commercialization within this six pages. And so the six pages already is not much space. So they're not expecting <laughs> a lot of commercialization in phase one. NSF is. They're expecting massive commercialization in phase one. NIH, not so much. You just have to show them in a few sentences that you've thought about it, that you're looking ahead to it, and there is a potential market for your product. NASA, as I mentioned, already has an i program now for uh, phase one awardees. The NASA session said you have to get past the gatekeepers. And there are gatekeepers who will make it hard for you to uh, contact the technical decision makers. But you can contact the technical decision makers directly if you want to, especially if you know them, especially if you have uh, technology that they would be interested in. And you can look up the, who they are online. NASA says they tend to fund uh, at early, earlier technology readiness levels. TRL is technology readiness level. So they tend to fund earlier stages. It doesn't have to be as close to productization as with the other agencies. So if you've got an earlier idea that might be of use to NASA, that would be something to think about. There was one session on uh, IP protection and they had a, uh, a large company, Lockheed, that talked about Lockheed's, uh, the way that Lockheed looks at its partnerships, because Lockheed works extensively via partnerships. They work a lot with small businesses, and that's why they were there. They were looking with good small businesses to partner with. And they say Lockheed is very concerned about protecting the intellectual property of the small businesses. Of course, this is a public session. This is what they're gonna say. 
But I think they were genuine because they said that uh, the bad press that they get and the legal costs that they get from anybody who's going to sue them for IP protection questions is huge. So they have to be very, very careful that they do nothing to put them in a liability situation regarding IP. So I got the sense from Lockheed, they were as concerned as small businesses are concerned about protecting the IP of small businesses. And when you're working with a large business as a partner, if you have IP to protect and you're worried about that, be explicit about it, be upfront about it, and talk about your concerns. That was their overall advice. If you're working with any large company, you say, I've got IP, I'm concerned about protecting it, the large company is probably concerned as well, and you can work together to, to figure that out. Just discuss that with them up front. <clears throat> Whole session on award administration. This was an interesting session, and this session uh, was conducted by lawyers and accountants who've been involved with all kinds of lawsuits where agencies are suing SBIR recipients for breach of contract, for not honoring the, the rules, for uh, not uh, implementing correctly. And their main points were, yes, you have to keep timesheets. You have to keep books. You have to keep track of all your hours of time. Timesheets are important. Even if you have a contract that is officially a uh, fixed price contract, which NSF is a fixed price contract, the phase one DODs are uh, in paper fixed price contracts, you still need to keep track of it as if it's a cost reimbursable contract, as if the government were going to look at every penny that you're spending. They don't always look at every penny that you're spending, but you need to conduct a, your business as if they were. So keep financial records, receipts of everything, good records, everything, all your transactions need to be associated with a specific job. So you do a full-blown job cost accounting system. PI pay came up during the session. You know, what, what do we pay ourselves? We're startup people. I'm used to working for nothing. Uh, so do I continue to work for nothing? Or you know, how do I establish a salary? The answer is no, don't work for nothing. Get paid for what you, you, you work for. Um, and if you're running the company, then you look at the Bureau of Labor Standards uh, standard rates and you just pick a standard rate for yourself according to the BLS website, and you can add a little bit for your leadership capabilities. So that's a generic guideline for what you can pay yourself. Part of the administration, retain proof of work from all consultants. And I've noticed in my practice, this gets overlooked a lot. You hire a consultant, they talk to you, they have meetings, and then sometime later, some agency might say, all right, prove to me that the consultant actually did something. You know, they're, well, you know, they looked at research, they looked up on the website, they talked to customers, but you don't have any proof that they actually did anything. So it's important to retain proof that the consultants actually did something. And a lot of times they don't have a specific word product, work product. A lot of times it is advice on process. You have a consultant come in, they're an expert in the field, you talk about your process, they say, no, don't do this, do this instead. You get advice, okay, great, the process is better now. Um, what's the work product? There's no work product. It's just an improved procedure. You can't point to the work that the consultant has done. In that case, diaries, logs, some kind of track record that they were there, they, they mentioned something, they provided this kind of advice. So keep track of what they did so you have some kind of work product from the consultants. And in general, the uh, administration say, if, you have, if you're a startup company, you know, no one expects you to be perfect. You're a startup company after all. If you make a mistake, you're not going to be sued for that. But if you make two mistakes or three mistakes, that's where you get into trouble. So do as much as you can to stay on track. Don't worry too much about getting into legal trouble unless you're actually abrogating the requirements of the legislation. And you'll probably be okay. And uh, you hear this all the time. Any questions, any concerns, talk to your program manager. So make sure you have the communications open with the program manager. There was a session on building your business. And uh, <clears throat> this is consistent with a long-term trend towards more commercialization. National Science Foundation is looking for healthy businesses. In general, if you do something that's good for your business, it's going to be good for your proposal as well. 
the things you need to do to grow a good business are the same things you need to do to submit a healthy proposal. Toward that end, it's nice if you can improve, include some kind of business expertise on your team. What NSF sees all the time is all kinds of technical expertise, grad students who are wizards in their technology producing great new materials, but they don't know anything about business. They've got a great idea. They think, oh, this is such a great idea. Surely a lot of people will buy it, but they don't have any idea really how to get it into the marketplace, what kinds of partners you need, what kinds of distribution channels there are how you place yourself in the market, who the influencers are compared to who the purchasers are, because they usually aren't, the, or they're often they aren't the same thing. So NSF likes to see business expertise on the team as well as technical expertise. Now, most of the startups here are technical expertise. That's just the nature of the game. And you don't really have business people who are central to your team. In that case, you can get an advisor or a consultant and just mention them, you know, we're working with so-and-so from Research Park. We're working with this individual as a business advisor. We're working with this individual from our investment company. So bring in advisors at least to mention if you don't have them on your team. Uh, also partners. If you're working with Lockheed's or Raytheon's or large players in the field, you can mention those. That's very strong in a proposal. And it's very strong for the business. <clears throat> in your proposal, Thing, and in your thinking, think in terms of business challenges as much as you do technical challenges. Being technologists, we all tend to think of, you know, well, the product might do this or the technology might do that, but we don't tend to be oriented towards, all right, what if the economy takes a downturn? What if, what if uh, relations with China sour and we can't do our manufacturing in China like we were thinking to do? What does that look like? So think in terms of the business aspects as well as the technical aspects. Other great partners to include, incubators, accelerators. I mean, you're in a great place here at Research Park. You could hardly get any better. So mention that in your proposal. We are housed at Research Park, or we are housed within the confines of the University of Illinois. This is a leader. It's one of the greatest places uh, in the nation to recognize as such as being an incubator, as a supporter of businesses. That's a plus. And likewise, the folks online that are possibly associated with their Good point. Yeah, yeah. Wherever you are, mention if you're associated with an incubator. That's strong. What are people looking for in terms of a business? Four main things. They want to know what your product is, what it is that you're selling. And while this seems obvious, it's not always so obvious, especially in the proposals that I read. I'll read about a proposal that's uh, an agriculture proposal, and they're going to do with something with sensors and ag in informatics and recommendations and um, you know what product are they actually selling are they selling a physical product are they selling a service uh, what is the actual product this doesn't always appear clear so you have to make sure and identify these are this is the product that we're selling we're selling a service we're selling technology we're selling uh, a service to distributors or to consultants we're selling directly to customers they want to see that and who will will actually buy it and why what are the real drivers of the people who are making the, de the purchasing decisions what what turns them on what are they looking for what matters to them a lot of the proposals that I read and I, I agree with this a lot of proposals already here's what the technology is here's here's how it's so great it will solve these world problems but I don't get as much of you know here's the person who will buy it here's what their main concerns are, here's why they will demand our product. And you need to talk and think in terms of that buyer, that influencer, that decision maker. How do you make money off of this? What's the real uh, dollar value? Are you selling a product for less than what you're charging? That's a good formula. But a lot of times the formula isn't that simple. So how do you make money from the product? And finally, as I mentioned before, include business skills on your team, not just technical skills. All right, pause for questions for a moment. Any uh, observations or questions? What yeah. types of things prove that someone has business acumen? What are the, what are the types of things they're looking for to be as something beyond just the technology you can actually have to uh, a couple things. First of all, 
representing the voice of the customer. You know, we have talked to 100 customers. We've talked to 200 customers. We have learned from talking with customers that where we thought they wanted X, they really don't want X. They want something a little bit different. They want Y. So that's one of two main areas. The second is uh, understanding of the marketplace. Here are the players that are out there. Here's the product that they offer. Here's how people who are buying the product are aware of these other products. We will compete with these products by offering something that they don't offer. We will work with distributors uh, to get into their catalogs so that our product is offered and compared with these others. Or, you know, we will, this is a, <clears throat> this is a, here's a workable strategy, just as an example. We will begin with online sales. Once we've gained traction in online sales, we will then approach Amazon. We will then approach other larger manufacturers. We will then approach big box stores to, to expand our sales once we've established ourselves in a niche market. If that's a strategy, if that works for your particular marketplace. The main point is that you understand how that marketplace works and that you can show, yeah, we understand the trade-offs in this marketplace. Here's how we'll start, here's how we'll expand. Well, another thing I'll mention along those lines, and NSF is big on this, uh, maybe more than the others, they love to see a five-year vision for companies. Uh, you know, you're not just a one product company. You don't want to be. If you're just a one product company, you're going to be limited in your success overall. But if you say, you know, we are starting out with this product, we will expand in these markets in years three to five. And then after that, we're going to expand in these markets and develop these products so that you show you've got a vision for the company in general and not just a path for this one product that you're developing. Good question. I mentioned before some uh, different avenues for funding beyond SBIR, but here are some more specifics on that. DARPA loves white papers. White papers, three, five, 10 pages, it kind of gives information about your technology. Um, so you can generate these white papers, give them to somebody at DARPA, you don't have to go through the SBIR avenue necessarily. You can just generate a white paper, find somebody in DARPA, you can look them up online, or if you're involved with the field, you might know who some of these leaders are. Send them the white paper saying, you know, we're working in a similar arena. Here's the area that we're working with. Here's some information about it. Does this interest you? And DARPA has many programs beyond SBIR. They've got the SBIR program as one of their main programs. They have a seedings program that I don't know much about, but it's an additional program, and they have one called Programs. It's a larger scale program. They do a lot with the broad agency announcements, BAAs, so read their BAAs, not just the SBIRs, but read their BAAs. You can get a lot of money outside the SBIR channel from DARPA. The Army as well, similar. They love white papers. They love to know what's available. They like to keep up on what can support their warfighters. If you talk to the technical contacts, you can reach out to them directly. Here's a white paper, here's some, something of interest uh, that, that we're working in your area. And they've got a lot of funding avenues outside of SBIR. DOT has a lot of funding avenues outside of SBIR. They have uh, all kinds of different specific programs and DOT comes out with very targeted proposals you know, or yeah, targeted solicitations. We've got a solicitation for uh, a specific sensor technology to put on buses to determine when people are having trouble loading the bus. That might be an example of one targeted one. So if you're doing something that DOT might be interested in, you have to keep abreast of these targeted opportunities. They love small disadvantaged businesses. They have a whole office for small disadvantaged businesses. If you fit into that category, look to their OSBDU for specific targeted applications. While I was there, I learned about some resources that I'll mention now, <clears throat> last couple of slides, that I wasn't aware of, uh, that might be of interest to you. The USPTO, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, has a lot of help for entrepreneurs. They have a whole resources website 
and here's the link, USPTO slash inventors. Uh, and I looked at this, this uh, website, a lot of information, there, just good basic information. If you want to read up on basic IP patent protection, this is non-biased, they don't have an ax to grind, they want to promote US economy, they want to promote trademark and intellectual property protection. So you get a lot of good information there. They also have a patent pro bono program where you can get help with your patent, especially if you're a disadvantaged business or a minority, especially if you're small, especially if you haven't been protected before, there are ways that they'll reach out. They will connect you with lawyers who are willing to work on a pro bono or reduce rate wage. So there's a lot of help there. Uh, a resource that I don't see represented too much in my work here is the Federal Laboratory Consortium. Federal laboratories are a great resource. They're great partners. Oftentimes you can get access to IP, you can get help. They're already federally funded. And so they will help you sometimes at no charge to your proposal. So you can get laboratory high level assistance without any additional expense to your proposal. There's a, a link here for the federal laboratories. So it's good to see what, what of them you might be able to partner with. They have technologies available for license. And they can help you in a number of ways and reduce rates, low charge rates. They often are not allowed to charge because they're already funded by the federal government. So they can be very strong partners. It also looks good in your proposal. If you're partnering with a federal lab, that's usually a plus. I mentioned the NIH application assistance program, especially for women owned uh, minority businesses, especially for first time applicants. Ah, and this is one thing that I learned. There is one of the agencies within NIH that posts several SBIR applications online. You can actually go to this link and see applications, successful applications. You go to the link there. Um, I didn't actually, the, your slide, if you click, if you got a PDF of the slide, you can click on this, but the link is sbir.nih.gov. So you go to sbir.nih.gov. There's a resources section, you click on that. And then within their resources page, there's sample SBIR applications from NIAD. And that particular agency has a lot of successful applications. I get asked for applications all the time. Can I see some examples? And usually I have to say, no, you know, I can't give any because they're all proprietary. Uh, maybe your friends are willing to share some, that's usually the best source. But I learned that the NIAD actually posts some that you can look at. And uh, the, I mentioned a slide deck here that's available on the link that was showing in the first page of your slides, along with these slides. And this is a slide deck that the SBIR conference sent out to people who were preparing for those one-on-one -on -one agency meetings. It's a slide deck on how to prepare for the meetings. Uh, and so it's a lot of good tips on what to prepare when you're planning to talk to uh, a program manager or somebody from the agency. And it's a good set of tips for any time you're talking to a program agency person, not just for the SBI conference one-on-one -on -one meetings. So it's a good general resource and it's available via that link along with these slides here. All right, uh, that is the, the main presentation that I have to offer. So any other questions, any other piece of information I can present? Observations, Chair? Yeah, any, any from online? All right, all right, and, um, my email is available. So if you have questions, feel free to contact me. There's no charge or anything for a quick question. So I'm available as a resource. If you've got a question here or there, just feel free to ping me, remind me who you are, and I'll be glad to help you if I can. All right, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.